Welcome to the NTN Nightly. I'm Nisha Charles. This edition's top stories. The first phase of the Huronar International Airport Redevelopment Project is set to begin. The government of St. Lucia continues to focus on improving the quality of life for the citizenry. Efforts at local government reform ramp up. All that plus the latest in youth development, sports and the NTN Nouvelle Arquil. The St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority, SLASPA, is preparing to undertake the first phase of the Huronara International Airport Redevelopment Project due to begin in the coming weeks. The $175 million US dollar project will deliver a modern facility in compliance with international aviation regulations, passenger-friendly, and open a world of business opportunity to the island. Lisa Joseph reports. The Hiranora International Airport Redevelopment Project is the largest infrastructural project to date to be undertaken by the government of St. Lucia and the St. Lucia Air and Seaports Authority, SLASPA. The first phase of the project is taken off. Following approval by the Development Control Authority, the DCA, a high-level team representing the project partners from the Overseas Investment and Development Corporation, OIDC, and its subsidiary, Overseas Engineering and Construction Company Limited, OECC, arrived in St. Lucia to supervise the commencement of Phase 1. And our first phase of this project is the clearing of the lands to allow us to be able to commence the project. And again, in any construction project, you would have to clear the ground, level the ground, build it, to receive the other components. First time I was here was uh, more than a year ago. I led a team with very experienced uh, engineers and technicians to uh, hear the needs of San Lucia about their new airport project. Okay, it's based on needs that San Lucia is expanding its economies, have a policy to expand their uh, development projects. So we came up with a very important firm in Taiwan who is currently doing uh, Terminal 3 in Taiwan, a terminal that can accept a yearly more than uh, 20, 30, even 40 million passengers. Okay, So with that team, we come up with a uh, report to give ideas to the government about their project. So how to do it? in what time, and what, to, what kind of points that we need to take care of. The project will significantly improve airside and airfield operations to include a new air traffic control tower elevating over 100 feet, five new parking aprons with connecting air bridges to a 337,000 square feet terminal building and new road infrastructure and a traffic management system. The massive development will undoubtedly redound to the benefit of St. Lucians, especially in job creation. We need to utilize as much as possible the local materials and human resources. Okay, we don't bring with us foreign workers. We don't occupy the, the, the opportunities for St. Lucia people. We wish to establish kind of terms that through this project, Sanusia, the company, and the people can benefit from it. Slaspa's acting general manager shows that 70% of the workers needed for the project will be local. I'm really, really happy that we'll be affording our people um, a lot of opportunity for employment, just not during construction, but you have to think, look at after commissioning an operation. It will be one of those infrastructure projects which will transform the economy, it will transform how St. Lucia moves forward. Overseas Investment and Development Corporation, OIDC, has over 20 years of experience in major infrastructure works with its subsidiary, Overseas Engineering and Construction Company Limited, OECC, having done more than 100 projects in the Caribbean and Latin America, including St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Argyle International Airport, which opened in February 2017. Vice President of OECC, David Chang, says the company prides itself on safety and delivery. All our engineers and the site workers, they shall be, have very good and very tough 
uh, training progress, and uh, everybody when they arrive at the site, they must follow the site safety procedure. And uh, for the airport pro project, there is more tight uh, uh, conditions uh, than any other public works, such as roads or normal buildings. Therefore, we shall follow the SLASPA, our empl employer, their requirements, and also follow the St. Lucia government's law. OIDC and OECC are said to be in regular contact with the architectural firm on the project, Hiri CBRE. The first phase of the HIA redevelopment project is expected to be completed within three months. From the Government Information Service, Lisa Joseph reporting. The Government of St. Lucia continues to focus on improving the quality of life for the citizenry. This as the Mon Fortune Liberty Park opens. General Novel reports. The Mon Fortune Liberty Park in the community of Mon Fortune is now officially opened. The park was the vision of St. Lucia's first female member of parliament, Haraldine Rock, a former representative for the area, who saw to it that government acquire a plot of land to create a public space for the residents. Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport and Civil Aviation, and Parliamentary Representative for Castries Southeast, Honorable Guy Joseph, welcomed the park, indicating that it had been on the cards for years. The minister added that he would like the community to embrace the park as its own. We want this facility to be one that has multi-use. This is not a facility, as you heard from Mr. Singh, that is going to be controlled by the government. We will help in the maintenance through the constituency council to do the maintenance and upkeep of this facility. But I am hoping that the residents of this area will get together and select at least a free person committee to be the persons to be overall responsible for this park, to determine who uses it and at what time they use it for what activity. Coordinator of the Constituency Development Program, Emmy Mitchell Joseph, shared some insight into her journey towards the completion of the park. This project became an avenue for temporary employment for a number of small contractors and their teams. And we cannot ignore the labor of love for community and desire to see things come to completion, which led to this successful completion of the Mon Park project. It is with humility I stand before you today at this opening. At the CDP, we often see the implementation of many infrastructural projects, large and small. But projects like these, we enjoy the pleasure of meeting the infrastructural whilst also enhancing the socio-economic needs of the community. Charged affairs of the Embassy of the Republic of China, Taiwan, Councillor Bill Wang, expressed that St. Lucia and the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan can achieve great things when they work together. And over the years, we have completed over 24,000 projects benefiting around 25,000 people all around the island. <laughs> May I dare say that, you know, the reach of the CTP projects, sorry, is there a correction? 4,000. Okay. But I may dare say that it reaches each and every community of St. Lucia, and it shows that if we were together, we work together sustainably, continually, we can work wonders together. The park that initially commenced in 2011 was opened on the 2nd of June 2019. It was funded by the government of St. Lucia and the government of the Republic of China Taiwan funded constituency development program. For the Government Information Service, I am Janelle Norville. Projects funded by the Republic of China, Taiwan have come in for high praises by Taiwan's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Dr. Joseph Wu. Dr. Wu visited St. Lucia last week for the signing and sword turning ceremony for the 42 million US dollar road improvement and maintenance program in Saltibus. 
Dr. Wu also visited projects funded by the Taiwanese in Sufre and Chozel, including the Hummingbird Beach Park. Uh, this is uh, some facilities that uh, we work together with St. Lucia, and we are very happy that it's in a very good operation. And I think it's a mutual assistance for mutual benefit. Uh, we set up this together with the uh, St. Lucian government uh, in order to benefit the uh, people of St. Lucia. But at the same time, it also benefits us because we know the experience and we will be extending this experience to uh, many other countries. And we also get supported by the government of St. Lucia and we appreciate it very much. Minister with Responsibility for External Affairs, Honorable Sarah Flood Bobra, says such projects are indicative of the relationship between St. Lucia and the government and people of the Republic of China, Taiwan, one that is centered on people development. We see development that touches the lives of people. We see development that takes what one might consider ordinary work, gives it structure and gives it dignity. And even in the brief moments that I've been here, I've heard of the people who were selling on the beach just in a tray, exposed to the elements, and today they can have adequate housing structure and an environment so their businesses can grow. And we're talking about ordinary people taking ordinary work and ensuring that we preserve its dignity and give people a livelihood and structure. Prime Minister the Honorable Alan Shastney as well as the Minister for Economic Development, Housing, Urban Renewal, Transport and Civil Aviation, Honorable Guy Joseph also formed part of the tour. The Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment has ramped up efforts at local government reform. Chevron Marius has details on the latest phase. The Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment has undertaken the second phase of the Local Government Reform Sensitization Training Workshop. Ms. Lenita Joseph is the Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment. Today we're actually having um, sessions with the mayors, the deputy mayors, the chairpersons, the deputy chairpersons and the clerks of councils so that we can build a more cohesive team so that when we're ready to roll out our reform agenda everybody's on the same page. I think it's important for us to have that human resource capacity that allows us to implement the agendas that have been set out for us. The local government authority is one that ensures that local government authorities are efficient, transparent, democratic, accountable and sustainable. The human resource component is very critical so quite apart from giving them the skills how they manage the resources that are given to them will be important. We're looking at financial planning giving them more authority to do um, what's necessary. Facilitator Mr. Anthony Watkins emphasized the importance of building collaboration between council workers and ministry staff. One of the things would be certainly clarity among all people who are in local government about really what is the purpose of lo local government and what does it have to deliver to the population. That would be one, clarity on that. The second, of course, would be the kind of synergy and collaboration that needs to take place between people who are appointed to councils and the people who work within the ministry. That is a critical linkage if these services are to be delivered. And of course, ultimately, the outcome would be an improved quality of life for the people of St. Lucia. Participants engaged in intense discussion and group activities, which examined strategic planning, team building, leadership, and human resource management. One of the things in the training was, was teaching about togetherness. Togetherness in that um, when it comes to councillors on council and clerks and workers, we, usually, we normally work as individual groups. And one of the things, the, even the LG, local government, one of the things that they teach us is to, to work as a group. St. Lucia established the Constituency Council Act in 2012. Reporting from the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Local Government and Empowerment, I am Chevroy Marius. And this is the NTN Nightly. Ryan O'Brien is up next. Do you know me? I've been forced to do this by my trafficker. I was promised a better life, but got forced into domestic servitude. I can be any age. I can be any gender. Any ethnicity. 
I am. I am. I am a victim of trafficking in persons. Know the signs. See it. Report it. If you see me, please help me. Call the TIP hotline at 847. Welcome back. We join Ryan O'Brien for the latest happenings in youth development and sports. Thanks, Misha. I'm Ryan O'Brien of your updates on happenings from the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports. Quarterfinal matches in the 2019 Ministry of Youth Development and Sports Secondary School Under-15-40 Over Cricket Tournament were played on Wednesday at the Grosile Plain Field. An outstanding spell of bowling by National Under-15 left arm seamer Aaron Joseph proved too hot to handle as Emery's College registered a convincing nine-wicket victory over Sir Ira Simmons Secondary. Batting first, Sir Ira Simmons Secondary skittled out for 26 in 15.3 overs, with no batsman reaching double figures. Joseph was the main destroyer, with five wickets for six, while Ty Harris picked up two wickets for one run. In reply, Samiris College rushed to 27 for one. Denzel Frederick struck 14. At the middle Phillip Park, in a low-scoring but exciting game, Trizel Secondary defeated Castries Comprehensive Secondary by 13 runs. Trizel Secondary batting first after winning the toss, made 65 all out in 17.2 overs, with Jude Joseph contributing a valuable 12. Bowling for Castries Comprehensive Secondary, Donovan Phillip back 5 for 14, and Joshua Sipal 2 for 10. In reply to what seemed like a modest target of 66, Good steady bowling by Chozel Secondary restricted Castries Comprehensive Secondary to 52 all out in 15.3 overs. Jabari Emilian, with 17, was the only batsman to offer any meaningful resistance to the Chozel Secondary bowling attack. Doing the damage of the ball for Chozel Secondary were Jordan Emmanuel with 4 wickets for 8 and Jahim St. Amy, 4 wickets for 9 runs. At the PI playing field, Sufre Comprehensive Secondary completed a comfortable five wicket victory over their opponents, Granivere Secondary. Granivere Secondary, batting first in a game reduced to 35 overs a side, made 108 for nine in their allotted overs, with Dequan Henry making 20 and Giovanni Alexander 15. Bowling for Sufre Comprehensive, John Modest picked up two for 10 and Kevin Gassi two for 14. In reply, Sufre Secondary finished on 109 for five in 26.3 overs, with Risa Alfred making 29, Kesman Ferguson 18, and Kevin Gassi 13. Granivere Secondary's most successful bowler was Giovanni Alexander, with 3 for 22. And at the Larry Seuss playing field in the Marbella Valley, Leones Comprehensive defeated Ajipo Secondary by 60 runs. Leones Comprehensive Secondary batting first, led by a maiden half century from Winner Island's under 15 player Seanil Edward was dismissed for 161 in 35 overs. Edward, batting with great authority, made a well-played 70, which included nine fours and two sixes. Other useful scores came from Tori Polius with 21, Kamani Law 15, and Khan Elcock 12. Antipo Secondary's captain, Willard Island's female player, Zayda James, was the school's most successful bowler with three for 21. Good support came from Jaden Burke with two for 32, and Royce Paul, 2 for 39. In reply, Anjipo Secondary dismissed 401 in 23.1 overs, with Zeta James top scoring with a defiant knock of 34, Royce Paul, 13, and McKay Bridget, 10. National under 15 reserve player Lee John continued his impressive bowling in the tournament so far. He was Leon Hess's comprehensive best bowler with figures of 5 for 26 in 7.1 overs. Sanjay Francis had figures of 2 for 28. The semi-finals on Friday will see St. Mary's College up against Chozelle at the Grosile Plain Field and Leon Hess Comprehensive taking on Soufre at Larissus. The finals are set for Wednesday, June 12. As Under-15 Cricket winds down, the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports continuing their partnership with the Ministry of Education and the St. Lucia Aquatics Federation to stage the inter-primary and inter-secondary schools meet on Friday, June 21st. The primary schools will have their competition between 9 a.m. and 12 noon 
while the secondary schools will head into the pool between 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. In both cases, schools have been invited to send their top swimmers and a maximum of 30 students can be entered by a school. The competition will be contested over several age categories. And that's your update from Move Development and Sports for today. I'm Ryan O'Brien. Thanks, Ryan. The Department of the Public Service has unveiled activities in observance of Public Service Week from June 17th to June 23rd. More in this report by Julita Peter. Over the years, the Department of the Public Service has ensured that Public Service Day, observed annually on June 23rd, remains a staple on its events calendar. The observance complements other initiatives and programs by the Department to recognize and reward the hard work and dedication of public officers. Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Department of the Public Service, Sheila Imbert, said this year's theme, Transforming Our Public Service, Building Excellence and Promoting Good Governance, Our Journey, Our Future, underscores the renewed thrust by the Department to provide the right environment where public officers can continue to thrive and be the custodians and promoters of efficiency and professionalism. The fact that the Department of Public Service has extended the observance of Public Service Day to an entire week speaks volume to the importance that we place on the well-being and overall development of our staff. Among the slew of activities planned for the Public Service Week, of note is the Departmental Staff Appreciation and Recognition Day slated for Tuesday, June 18th. We are saying to our public officers that your contributions have not gone unnoticed. We are saying to you that we care, we hear you, we understand your concerns and the sacrifices that you make, even at times with limited resources. Among the activities planned, a panel discussion, a job shadowing day for upper form secondary school students, and a job swap among public officers. Shertal Wilson Lawrence is a chairperson of the Public Service Day Planning Committee. We have the ecumenical service, which is scheduled for Wednesday, June 19th at 9.30 a.m. at the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. Every year, the ecumenical service plays an integral part in the commemoration of Public Service Day. It is intended to bring public servants together to pray, give thanks and praise as we come together as a nation to transform our public service by building excellence and promoting good governance. Public Service Week will culminate with a health fair in collaboration with several health institutions on June 21st at the Castro's Waterfront, offering on-site consultations and health services to public officers and to the general public. From the Department of the Public Service Communications Unit, Julita Peter reporting. And stay with the NTN Nightly. Up next, Primus Hutchinson is here with the NTN Nouvelle Arqueo. I have my mobile, landline, cable TV, and internet service. If I have a problem with any of the services, what should I do? Here's what you should do to resolve the problem. First, get and fill out a complaint form and lodge your complaint with the service provider. If after 30 days there is still no solution, you may contact your National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission, NTRC. This message is brought to you as a public service announcement by Ectel, the NTRC, and this station. Welcome back. We join Primus Hutchinson for the NTN Nouvelle Arqueur. Mr. Madam, Department of Responsibility for Information of Government Settlers, GIS, Assembly Television, National PIA, NTN, Capazato, Nouvelle Arqueur, Pazato, Primus Hutchinson, Lime, Deville Castui, Peterson Francis, Jean Co, Fayon Appel, pour moun dépose zodi des affaires gwes primè. Lime Francis te ka pale de gravement situasyon sa la, ki eksplike ki, mon yon moun ka dépose zodi ki nyan pil gwes ka bouche se ti yo an vil kastri. Selon Lime Francis, se di fwa business avil la ni brize ekouajman 
pour assister à la réduction du problème de la qui a été cause de la pour plein et puis de l'eau. Parce que les gens qui ont jeté l'huile à ce canal là qui a bouché ce tir au ville. Le maire Francis veut dire que ça c'est un gros problème et que n'importe quelle façon qu'il a approché, il souhaite pas sa terre et l'environnement. C'est un établissement business, c'est un établissement business en ville là, ni pour accepter la responsabilité, et bien il y a trouvé le droit la loi. Il a remarqué que ces ordres là qui apparaissent et bien visible dans ces restaurants, il dit aussi, là j'en ai plusieurs plaintes que j'ai faites concernant les qualités mauvaises lors de ce qui a sorti de ce tir. Le maire Francis veut dire qu'il a mis ces établissements de business qui a vendu, mangé à son garde, parce que dans cette ville-là, il a servi la loi pour assurer la qualité de la petite salle. Par contre, il y a un établissement pour les résidents ni tirer récréation pour point anti pause et qu'assembler ensemble pour causer j'ai ouvert officiellement en paresse au monde pour j'ai été commencé depuis l'année 2011 mais tu ouvert officiellement les DG l'année ici représentatif pour paresse là on est avec Guy Joseph à ce moment premier ministre là et l'autre ministre gouvernement tu découvre plein de l'honneur pour représenter établissement ça là ce gouvernement c'est aussi qui finance et facilite ça là à ce moment gouvernement de République Chine Taiwan en bas programme de développement les divers powers. Pour ça, c'était WEV, première femme qui a trouvé officiellement à Kai Palema, quand on a Kai Palema, défunt Madame Haroldine Rock, qui aussi c'était représentatif pour Powers. Madame Rock a approché le gouvernement pour te acheter mon soutien ça là, pour te établir une facilité publique pour les résidents, te passer le temps après un jour de travail, et bien pour prendre un petit pause et assez ensemble pour causer. Grounds Bowl Canary a trouvé ouvert officiellement finissement la semaine passée. C'est une facilité sport qui les joue à cricket avec l'autre sport et caspé pour un bon de trois temps. Pour célébrer cette occasion, la a tenu un jouer cricket à parmi les membres et aussi une compétition de football à parmi les vétérans et les jeunes. Le représentatif du Parlement pour la commune, Honorable Dominique Fede, a déclaré que depuis le gouvernement a entré à pouvoir, il a déjà travaillé tout le pour essayer d'improuver à son laver le monde en ville, en village Kanawi. En parmi ces projets que j'ai fait en village là, c'est pour Kanawi qui a battu à un plus haut degré. Service Wi-Fi qui a pas ni pour, j'ai pas Kanawi pas ni pour payer pour ça. Le rangement qui est fait pour ces écoles là, et qu'on se travaille pour te improuver, faciliter pour tous les services là. On va faire des remercier ces joueurs sport, les noms et puis femmes, et qu'on se les résidents pour patience, yo, du moins ta gouvernement, t'es qu'à travailler pour implémenter. Ce projet ça là. Et pour ces mesdames, c'est comme ça nous bout de nouvelles là. Je vais remercier autant pour qu'à garder. Je vais avoir une invitation pour que je ne puisse pas considérer qu'on se fait la vie. Je vais présenter une autre nouvelle à Coyol. Après ça, je vais vous présenter une nouvelle à Coyol. Après ça, je vais vous présenter une nouvelle à Coyol. Merci de votre pile, Primus. Et voici ce qui se passe à nous. Partly cloudy and hazy skies, occasionally becoming cloudy with some scattered showers. A weak tropical wave located about 426 miles or 809 kilometers east of the Lesser Antilles is moving westward near 12 miles per hour or 19 kilometers per hour. The wave is expected over the far southern Lesser Antilles by tomorrow Friday. Saharan dust is present in the vicinity of this wave and this is limiting convection and showers. A second tropical wave located over the central tropical Atlantic is moving westward near 12 miles per hour or 19 kilometers per hour. Tropical cyclone formation is not expected over the tropical Atlantic during the next five days. The tide for Castries Harbor was low at 12.13 p.m. and will be high again at 7.04 p.m. The tide for VA4 Bay was low at 1.40 p.m. and will be high again at 8.11 p.m. The seas moderate with waves four to six feet or 1.2 to 1.8 meters. The sun will rise Friday at 5.34 a.m. And that brings us to the end of the NTN Nightly. Join us next time at 7 p.m. with a repeat at 7 a.m. You can also catch up with us anytime on the St. Lucia Government Facebook page or YouTube channel. I'm Nisha Charles. <laughs>